Thank you all for having me, and thank you for being here. Um, I'm deeply appreciative of this honor and grateful for the, the gracious welcome that you have shared with me. And I, um, I'm humbled. Press down and press together so that the story and life of one is part of the story and life of the other, indistinguishable and flowing together, yet each distinct and knowable as the layers of the blue-gray limestone that underpin us in this place. They came by the scores of hundreds through Pennsylvania down the Valley of Virginia following the Great Road. After crossing the New River at Ingalls Ferry, the road climbed steadily. Eight miles west of the river crossing, approaching the summit of a long ridge, the teams of horses and oxen would have strained in their harness and yokes against the backward pull of the climb, and those afoot would have, learned, would have leaned into the effort. Reaching the crest, the road descended through the town, spread along the road. Then the only town in the 60 miles between Withful and Christiansburg, major stops on the road west. Newburn derived its initial life from the commerce associated with the great road. Taverns, harness makers, saddleries, wagon makers and repair shops, liveries, wheelwrights, blacksmiths, cobblers, and a host of other craft artisans did business in Newburn. Along this road, through this place, journeyed all of the contradictions and complications of American society. Through Newburn came members of the first wave of waves of immigrants to America. For many, these were journeys to, take a, take, to stake a claim in a new promised land, to have more than they had had in their earlier lives in their former places. Others, wives and daughters mostly, had no choice and made their way from homes and neighbors, uprooting families because the head of the household had determined it so. Still others came along this road as chattel. In the first decades of the 19th century, Virginia was the leading exporter of slaves to the plantations of the Deep South. Along the great road, these men, children, women, young and old, torn from family and friends, came in groups, chained, manacled, and bound together, walking and stumbling, weeping. Their white drivers riding in wagons and on horseback. In 1834, an Englishman noted a coffle of 300 slaves wading, faltering, and dragged across the New River at Ingalls Ferry on its way to Tennessee. Somewhere in Newburn, as in every town along the great road, there was a pen without shelter from the weather, stinking of human excrement and misery, where these people were chained and kept, allowed only enough movement to fix their meal and to bed for the night before pushing on. He was 16 years old when he stepped from the train into the soot coal dust of Keystone in MacDowell County, West Virginia. It was 1926, and he was there for the same reason that hundreds of thousands of others had arrived in MacDowell County, to lay claim to the American dream. There were farmers from the mountains of Virginia and Tennessee, African Americans fleeing the oppression and violence of the Jim Crow South, there were the Italians, the Hungarians, the Poles, the Lithuanians, the Czechs, and the Slavs. There were the Eastern European Jews and the Irish Catholics. By 1945, there were nearly 100,000 people living in MacDowell County, 
And the coal and coke, the steam and steel and byproducts they had produced were the bones and sinews, the lifeblood of the American industrial engine. Able to provide for his family in ways that he could have only dreamed about as a boy, this 35-year-old man claimed the one thing that he knew would define it, that he had reached what every American knew what it meant to be an American. He bought a home here in Keystone, MacDowell County, West Virginia, was all that America stood for. They stand along the railroad that in the 1850s had replaced the Great Road. And they stand in a community that within the lifetimes of some persons in that crowd that day was relocated from that old road to sit along the railroad in the days after the Civil War. Just as with the towns along the Great Road, Medivue's life and purpose was inextricably linked with the railroad, what it brought and what it took away. A place of several dozen stores, two doctors, a creamery, craft artisans, and restaurants, Medivue was the commercial and shipping center for the rich agricultural valley of the Middle Fork of the Holston River. Though defined in its contradictions, like every other community in America, they were, they were, they were a people divided by class and race and gender. Their civic lives too often shaped and misshapen, defined by the accidents of birth. But this rural community would be remembered as a neighborly, welcoming place through the generations. From a distance, it is possible to see where the one layer becomes the one above it, joined to the ones below. From a distance, it is possible to see where the deep fathoms of stone and story, blue-gray with the water and sky and mud, thin and then thick with the rise and fall of inland sea. From a distance, it is able, we are able to see where at once they meet again, soil and trees and air and sky. Where the layering civic work continues of story, memory, and place. They left Keystone in November 1948, sensing the changes that were coming, fearful of losing their stake in the American dream. The man had come as a 16-year-old, and then, 22 years later, he and his family moved to Newbern. Brokenhearted at the loss of friends and connection, he was unable to make that adjustment, that new alignment. Four years later, on the morning of July the 4th, 1952, at the age of 42, he died of a massive heart attack. At Christmas, 1953, she was 44 and had been a widow for 17 months. The man in the photograph was the new chief for the Pulaski County Life Saving Crew, the first ambulance service in that county. The widow is handing the chief of the Life Saving Crew a check representing the money she and her fellow members of the Newburn Community Improvement Club had raised going door to door. For months, the club had collected nickels, dimes, quarters from their neighbors so that at that Christmas party, they could present the newly formed organization with enough money to purchase its first ambulance. On the morning that her husband had been stricken, there was not an ambulance to transport him to hospital. At that time, in that place, the funeral home's hearse doubled as the community's ambulance, and she, so she called Stephen's funeral home. Her husband died in the hearse as it took him to hospital. That same morning, she tried to find a doctor to get some help, but the town's one doctor could not come. This woman and the other members of the community club determined that no one else should have to face such a thing again. And in the months since, they had worked to recruit a doctor to come to Newburn. 
The club appointed this recent widow as the chair of the recruitment committee. For two years, she wrote and telephoned every medical school on the East Coast, asking if there was a new graduate who would be willing to come to a little town in Southwest Virginia. In 1953 and 1954, there were few graduates of medical school willing to come to places like Newburn, Virginia, and there were even fewer graduates of medical school who were women. Yet this widow found one, recruited her, and the new doctor set up practice in Newburn in 1954, the spring following the photograph. The doctor would practice medicine in Newburn for almost 45 years. In McDowell County, the population peaked in 1948 at 100,000 people. Except for one, in every decade since, the county has lost 25% of its population, so that by 2010, there were fewer than 24,000 people living in McDowell. What once was considered the billion-dollar coal field, the Pocahontas billion-dollar coal field, is now one of the poorest counties in the United States. And while the whole country, county suffers, the section of McDowell that suffers most in all of this is the Big Creek District, just over the mountain from Keystone. In 1991, in protest over the lack of clean water, appropriate wastewater treatment, the lack of child care, and a host of other symptoms of the abandonment of their community, seven women in Coretta formed Big Creek People in Action the mission of which is to foster a community in which people learn, play, and grow together and prepare themselves for success in the 21st century. Big Creek People in Action has a vision of the people of McDowell as empowered, self-sufficient, self and living in communities that are economically vibrant, democratic, and socially just. By 2002, Big Creek People in Action had brought legal action that resulted in McDowell County's first public water system, had established the county's first child care center with a sliding scale fee, had established programs in adult literacy and youth leadership development, and were vocal, vocal advocates for the reform of the public schools. On the afternoon of May the 2nd, 2002, a massive thunderstorm broke over McDowell and for the second time in 10 months, the county suffered a 100-year flood. 85% of all homes either sustained damage or were completely destroyed. Seven people died. The people of McDowell County were quite clear. The exacerbating factor in all of this is the practice of mountaintop removal. With nothing left on the mountains to hold back the rain on the afternoon of that May Thursday, the water, mud, logs, and debris poured from the sides of what was left of the mountains, destroying everything in its path. The Coretta Community Center, once the water had dried out of the ground floor, became an emergency response center. From this building, Big Creek People in Action distributed 17,397 meals and several tons of supplies. Now, no one knows much about this. The war on terror and the search for Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction filled all the headlines that may. Taking a break between preparing the noon meal and the supper meal, Marsha Timpson, a member of the staff of Big Creek People in Action, looked at me exhausted, worried, fearful, and angry and said, I reckon America would just rather not have to deal with us. No one thought that a place such as Medivue could accomplish it. After all, the story of Medivue is the story of every rural American place since 1945. Loss, decline, people going to places more fashionable, the collapse of the agricultural infrastructure. 
What began as an effort to hold to the traditions of neighborliness became the desire to have a building where the community could gather and share a meal. With time and work, with an honest grappling with who we are, we began to think what a different future for our children and our grandchildren might be like in Meadowview. We learned that more than 75% of our people did not have access to health care. Clearly, if Medview's legacy of neighborliness was to shape the place that was to come, that reality would have to change. We worked, we listened, we heard no dozens of times, we dealt with indifference and disbelief, and through it all we refused to back down or walk away. In June 2006, Mediview was awarded $700,000 in federal block grant money to build a sliding scale medical clinic and community center. The only stipulation was that the total cost of construction, along with two years operational cost, would need to be raised and committed before the $700,000 would be released and construction could begin. We were given six months to raise the money. Between June and December, the people of Medivue raised over $850,000, largely in small donations of $25, $50, and $100. We are finding that as difficult as that work was, it was only the first step in a very, very long road. And the next work, the next things will require more of us than anything before. And frankly, we are beginning to wonder if we are equal to the work, if we will fail our place, if the pressures against us are too great. Our future is not assured. What do these American places layered as limestone teach us? What does this layered limestone teach us about our citizenship? From these layers of stories and memories, service and citizenship, we know that our places are complexly formed from the ongoing and enduring interaction of the natural environment, the built environment, and human culture and history. We know from these layers that endemic to every social interaction is the reality of conflict. Some of this conflict is sharp and hot, some of it burning low, long, and slow, but all of it real. If human relationships, human culture and history are part of what makes our places, are part of that layered limestone, then every place is shaped in and is the product of long human conflict. And all of it, all of this many-layered reality is grounded in and built from the foundations of the earth. The complexity of our places, accepting and living the conflicts that shape them, teaches us that, our, that there are conflicts, questions, and issues in every place and from place to place that are so complex, so intractable, that there are no single right answers. Our places require of us not the one right answer, but the honest response. The right answers are often brought to us, we have found, by the experts and planners. And they usually lack a resonant honesty. They're not part of the layers of the place. Our places demand of us a citizenship of honesty, born of our heartache and loss, our grief, our miserable mistakes, and our utter failures, but also an honesty born of our hope, rooted in our place. And these places teach us, demand from us a radical, expansive creativity that is rooted in and grows from the three defining realities of every place. A creativity that understands political boundaries are arbitrary and relatively recent, and that all places, like the layers of limestone, are deeply and forever joined. Every place is two places. One of those places is the place of time, a 
public policy, of the present economic and political realities with which we contend. The other reality, the other place, is that of the rhythms and cadences, the whisper and hum of the sun burning off the morning mist, the time that cannot be measured by clock or schedule, but resonates with the deep layers of the place. And it is from this second reality, the long reality of earth and sky, of land and water, story and memory, that must give rise to a new civic creativity, one that will not take the policymakers' no or the economists' assessments, but sees the place as vital, alive, and worthy of all our best efforts. This is the creativity we need this is the creativity that is all but lost under the welter and then the crucible of globalization. Not far from here, rising above the new river, holding in it the memory of inland sea, rivers and rain, sky and mud and drought, and the generations of people who have worked out their lives in this American place are Godby's Cliffs. Two miles north to the north and west of the cliffs is the old town of Newburn. Just a few miles downstream is Ingalls Ferry where the Great Road crossed the New and nearby is the railroad trestle that replaced that Great Road over which the coal shipped from Keystone and the produce from Meadowview. And close at hand is the I-81 bridge today carrying its many thousands more. Few who spend time on Claytor Lake would know that the, cliffs, that the cliffs we see today extend nearly 100 feet below the surface of the water. And then deeper still into the foundations of the earth. The layers of that limestone cliff bear in them lives and stories and memories that are now lost to us the lake covering farms and lives and struggles and questions about which we can only guess. We, you and I, are a part of those layers of limestone and story, history and truth, and a citizenship of place carries in it the layers of this place. We are it and it is us. And there at the top of that cliff where soil and rain and woods and the human community continue the long, hard work of layering, the question for us then becomes, if they of that layered limestone are the we of this place and the we of this place are in those struggles now silent and forgotten as rocks under a lake, What does that mean for our honesty, for our creativity, for our service, for our American citizenship? Thank you. Um, thank you, Tao, for helping us to understand and share, and share your sense of new citizenship of place that has really the potential of reshaping our public life. Uh, we are looking forward to continue learning with you and applying lessons learned this evening to our life, to our communities, to our work. I'm Sarah Lyon Hill. I'm a doctoral student in the Planning, Governance, and Globalization uh, program, and I'm a member of Community Voices. Tao, we greatly appreciate your leadership and vision of community. Um, and again, we'd just like to thank you for coming here tonight and sharing your vision with us. Thank you. Uh, Tal, your talk has helped to frame the next part of this evening, um, an interview between you, our very own uh, Community Voices, John Catherwood Ginn, and of course, all the lovely people here tonight. Uh, basically, John will engage you with some questions that will help us look more closely at community and citizenship. John. Thanks, Sarah. Right. 
I'll echo her thoughts. Thank you once again for coming. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, as Sarah just said, my name is John Catherwood Ginn. I'm a graduate student in Directing and Public Dialogue in the Department of Theater and Cinema here at Tech. And uh, in this dialogue, we're going to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about your sense of community, this notion of this being a citizenship, or the citizenship of place, as well as some of your ideas and suggestions about how to improve our own sense of community in public life. Um, I have a series of questions sort of to kick things off, but after we have a dialogue for a while, I'd invite you to please share the questions you might have for Tal or comments you have about what he had to share. So uh, in, order to, in, in terms of starting things, one thing that I found really distinctive about what you just shared was just the power of story and the presence of story. Mm -hmm. Would you really want to talk a bit about what you feel the value of the presence of story is in this notion of citizenship of place? Well. A good story well told is the best teacher. And, uh, and I grew up listening to good stories. Not long kinds of stories, but the stories that were told to illustrate a point or to drive home you know, a truth. And that's the kind of teaching that I try to do. But I also know that until we begin to hear the stories of a place we haven't really understood that place. And those stories, like the limestone itself, are deep, and, they, and the more we listen, uh, the more complex those stories are and the more connected they are. Um, I have found, you know, for one reason or another, I've got one of those catalog minds that kind of keeps stories in it. And um, like in Medivue, I have heard you know, my neighbors tell me one or two stories of the same event. When I heard the first one, I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. When I heard the second one and the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one, I began to realize this is really pretty significant. And, um, and it seems to me that, that there was no other way to get at that and to find the appreciation of that without keeping my mouth shut and listening to some stories. And now, interestingly enough, I can tell those stories. Some of them, not all of them. And that seems to me to be um, a profound honor. Mm -hmm. So where's your story in this r relating of some of your family members, for instance, in Newburn? I'd be fascinated to hear where you, where you position yourself in that. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, huh. I think that I like to think that um, I'm using those stories to, to teach my children hmm. what it means to be in service in a place and to honor a place that may not be honored in much of American culture, and to create for them the kinds of opportunities and the kinds of values that I see lived out in these stories from my family, with all of their mistakes and all of their failures and all of that. Uh, there are people in this room right now that I've been listening to from stories all of my life. Now, all of them are kin to me either. I mean. Uh, <laughs> There are a couple of folks right here on, close on the third row that I remember. Uh, my father was a veterinarian, and, and I loved to go on calls. And uh, a couple of these guys, I spent more than one afternoon sitting on a truck bumper listening to them talk. <laughs> they didn't know I was listening. Um, but I learned. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't really tell you where one thing stops and the other starts. In terms of other stories in your story? And in terms of my citizenship, and in terms of what I believe, and in terms of what I try to do in my work. Mm -hmm. On my best days, it's a seamless garment. Well, that notion of a citizenship of place, just by invoking the word citizen, a question that comes to mind for me is one of boundaries. Um, if one aspires to be a citizen of place, what are the boundaries they might set Would you, in terms of where does my sense of citizenship end? Is it of McDowell County, for instance, or is it of my state, is it of my nation? Would you be willing to talk a little bit about what may you see as the boundaries for a person who would consider themselves a citizen of place 
and the tensions that might exist locally or globally? Well, you know, I think that's a really important question because I think it pushes us beyond understanding our places only in terms of political boundaries. And I, 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 I sort of alluded to this in the talk, but, um, you know, that there is a boundary between MacDowell County and Tazewell County and another one between Tazewell County and Smith County and another one between Smith County and Washington County is nothing but the, the capricious whim of a legislative body somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and we're connected. And what happens in McDowell County is directly related to the things that I have to deal with in Washington County. And what happens in Pulaski County is directly related to what to decisions that get made in Blacksburg or Montgomery County. And, and what happens in the eastern United States are connected in some way, you know, to all that happens in the western United States. And so what I want folks to understand that all of our places are deeply and, and forever joined and that I might, this might be the place that I derive my most meaning that gives me the substance and the direction of my life. But it's not us and them. We're not them and us. It's all of us. And just like a place is constituted out of all of the people. All of those places constitute the place in the real way. And I know that's sort of mm, whatever, but still, um, I think that's what keeps it from being real narrow. Mm -hmm. But that question of, since you set up that binary of the us and them that we hear so often, particularly in political discourse, yep. Um, uh, it brings to mind the notion of the insider and the outsider. Yep. And it was, when we were speaking earlier today, you talked about um, a, a common reality, unfortunately, is that between those that would consider themselves outsiders and those that would consider themselves or considered by others as outsiders, there's quite often an abrasiveness, yep. which um, the, the term you had used. Would you talk a bit about what's a remedy for that abrasiveness or some considerations that a person needs to get into in doing community-engaged work about that embracedness? Well, I think that comes from understanding that our places are constituted by issues and questions that are so complex there isn't any one right answer. Mm -hmm. And that what is required is a, is, a, is a civic honesty and an acceptance of other people's ideas. That's a lot easier said than done. <laughs> but I think, I think that's one thing. I also think that uh, just an awareness of the fact that of the other person's story, whether, they, whether they're from here or not, whether they have deep roots here or not, then awareness of that story and an appreciation for it and a willingness to listen to it. And that sort of, I think that's the way that we begin to move beyond that. It's a, it's a, it's, you got, it takes commitment, you gotta wanna do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard. But yeah, and, and a lot of people criticize my work and the idea because of that very thing. Because they say, well, it, you just, just degenerate into an insider, an outsider kind of thing. I don't believe so. Not if you take seriously the complexity of our places and that all places are forever joined. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this time I'd love to be able to pass the ball to audience members that might have questions or comments they'd like to share with Tal. If you do, I'd ask that, um, since we're recording tonight's talk, um, I'd ask that if you have a question, to please just raise your hand, and I can indicate um, that you can speak. And we have some folks down here that would be happy to run the mic to you so we can uh, get a chance to hear your voice out to the full group. So is there anybody out here who might have a question or a comment for Tal? So earlier when we were talking, um, I'm from the county right beside Washington County, rest of county, and back home, as you know, we've had so many layoffs in the coal mines. You know, Buck One closing just a couple weeks ago, and you know, hundreds of miners losing their jobs. I'm wondering how you think that will affect the layers within the community. Yeah, and that's tough. Um, 
I talked a lot about this. I was at a meeting yesterday of the Federated um, Appalachian Housing Enterprises. It's a, you know, a group, a collective of, of housing organizations throughout the Appalachian region. And what we were talking about there was that um, for a lot of ways, and for a lot of different reasons, in, South, in, in, in Southwest Virginia that is very clearly connected to coal in Southern West Virginia, and, and we can talk about this, uh, probably not in this context, but, but we have come to understand that there is no alternative to coal. And that we've come to believe that it's coal or nothing. And for those of us that are in it every day, and, and you know what I'm talking about, right now in that part of the world there is a civil war going on, and it's fought sometimes by violence, but more often by words and hurt feelings and umbrage and silence and innuendo. And they are, and people are dividing themselves between friends of coal and not friends of coal. And I would suggest that it's not so much a war on coal, but it's a war on each other. And we are fighting each other because for whatever reason, we don't have any other alternatives. Our backs are against the wall. And anybody that's honest about it would have to say it's just, it's killing us. It's tearing the shreds of our common life into dust. And I, I, I have to think that, that what is required of us now, desperately required of us, is to learn the kind of, of radical, expansive creativity that helps us understand our places in different ways and helps us to begin to retool our places for an entirely different life. We talked at the Fahi meeting about what would it be like if, if, the, if there was in southwest Virginia or if, if in those counties in southwest Virginia where we are most hard-pressed by the issue of coal, if we could become sort of the national capital for green building and we could learn and teach you know, with a network of community colleges and vocational schools and public high schools, if we could begin to, to retool ourselves to be experts to ship that knowledge out to the world about what it's like to build green buildings. And that people would come there not only to learn it, but to hire our people to teach others. That's just one idea. But it's an idea that I think is rooted in, in that sort of that second reality of place, that place, the, the, the whisper and the hum of the place, the cadences and rhythms. But for a lot of different reasons, right now we don't think there are any alternatives. And I think most places that have been through similar kinds of things, and I would re remind people, you know, Pittsburgh went through the similar kind of thing. Um, that, that we, we make those alternatives. We create it through a, a creativity, a civic creativity of place. I know exactly what you're talking about. A day doesn't go by. A day does not go by that those of us down in that end of Virginia don't grapple with it. I'd like to go back to the issue of insiders and outsiders that you uh, have both raised. Yes, sir. In my experience and in a good bit of writing that I've done, I have been really interested in that. Uh, I lived in Giles County in a beautiful valley for 10 years, and I was a newcomer, a come here, an outsider, what, and there are multiple terms for that, I'm sure. 
And there were people there who were fifth, sixth, even seventh generation families who were farmers and, and mountain people. Two very different cultures. Some people would talk about people like me as PhD polluters because we had moved into that valley. But my experience is that insiders and outsiders there came together in a powerful way over a threat to the community. Uh, Appalachian Power, AEP, wanted to put a huge power line through uh, the valley or the hollow. An organization fought that for four or five years, newcomers and natives, and won. And then my experience for insiders and outsiders, they came together for an opportunity. And that opportunity was another four or five year project of people getting together and creating the Greater Newport Rural Historic District, mm -hmm. which is on both the state and national registers. And that particularly exactly gave right. people a sense of identity, a sense that folks beyond Newport and Clover Hollow were paying attention to them. And that's, a, that's a really good uh, observation, I think. And I think I said in the roundtable uh, at lunch this afternoon, um, you know, if I live to be 112, I will still be in Meadowview. I won't be from around there. And, you know, I know that. And I, you know, that's just the way it is. But building that community center, with the understanding that every single person has the gifts and the talents, the, the graces to make a difference in the life of that place. And if you honor it in others, they honor it in you, generally. And even though I ain't from around there, and I, it's just the way it's going to be, we're able to get some pretty good things done. And uh, I'm proud of that. Other questions or comments? Hi, Charles Good. I was wondering if you could do us the great favor of relating just a little bit of what you said uh, earlier today regarding the work of your students and many students at Emory and Henry who are so integrated into the community. Well, I can do that. <laughs> I, in fact, I very proud to do that. Um, at Emory and Henry, um, we, um, we practice what I describe and what we are known for now as a place-based model of education and service. And we give our students um, opportunities in connection with their classes, in connection with their extracurricular activities, in connection with um, you know, in, just if they want to do anything, is to be involved in the community, to be involved in the places where we are partnered. A place-based model of education, as I articulate it, means that our partnerships aren't with agencies and organizations, but our partnerships are with places, so that we can see the systemic issues and we can see, you know, long years down the road, we're going to try to work on the issue of poverty or health care, we're going to try to find some solutions to it in this place, this place connected to others. Our work is grounded on two defining principles. The first of which is that every person, I don't care where you've been or where you haven't been, I don't care what you've done or what you haven't done, I don't care how much education you had or you haven't had, I don't care anything about that. Every single person has the gifts and the talents the vision and the passion to make a difference in the lives of somebody else and in the life of their place. And on this screen, there were dozens of people. And the second principle is like unto it. And that is that every place, whether it's fashionable or not, whether it's blessed with consumer goods or not, whether you can get good coffee and hear live music or not, every single place has the potential to be a safe and a healthy and a good place for all of its people. And my job at Emory & Henry, the work that consumes me day and night, 
is to give students hundreds of opportunities to learn that about themselves, to prove it to each other, and to teach it to the world. And right now, I think I said in class, 98.7% of our students last year, in the last academic year, 98.7% of our students were engaged in community service of some kind throughout the academic year. On that last topic, because that statistic is incredible. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm surprised at it too. It really is. Because <laughs> really I'm there. <laughs> yeah, and, and when, when I asked you about that earlier today, you'd mentioned that you felt that it was a, um, a result of the ethos of the institution. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about that? How was that fostered at Emory and Henry, and what could other institutions learn from that if they start well, to develop the same kind of community engagement among their student body? Okay. Well. I think that part of it is rooted in the fact of how Emory and Henry was founded. It was developed by people that came along that great road and settled in that part of Virginia in the late 1700s. And they believed that there needed to be an institution that was going to equip a new citizenry for the American Republic. And keep in mind that in, in England, um, there were only two universities, Oxford and Cambridge. And in Ireland, there was only one, Trinity. And it was only for the Protestants. And what they visioned was an institution that opened its doors to anybody that wanted to come. And it gave them the skills and the talents and the abilities to go out and to build strong communities on the American frontier. And ever since then, Emory and Henry has been putting out public school teachers, and preachers, and lawyers, and doctors, members of town councils and mayors, men and women that, that never hold a public office and, and do good work quotidian work every single day. And that's what we built on. And then, you know, Scott was there when we were working on this. We, we began to realize that there was a moat around Emory. Hmm. It was an invisible moat, but it was there nonetheless. And we tried to create on our campus, it's not as big as tech, but we tried to create on our campus spaces, opportunities for, for people from the community to come in, after school programs, special kinds of parties for kids, training events for community leaders, that we just tried to reopen those doors and, and to define that education is for the public good. And um, we don't have it all figured out yet. And we've made some mistakes, but there's a, there's a, I don't know whether it's a need or whether it's just the desire to hear it, but it, it strikes a chord in our students and in people in the community and in our faculty and staff. And I really do believe that, that with their help, we have maybe not remade, but reconfirmed what we started out to be. So. All right, then at this time, I want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. Tal, thank you as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to be here.